What's up, friendly neighborhood nerds? This is Judah Rad. Today, I am joined by the two co-writers of Valiant Entertainment's The Harbinger. We have Colin Kelly and Jackson Lansing joining us. Um, you two have come to the right place because I am, <laughs> I, would, I, I would say, a pretty insane Valiant fan. Um, I would say it's about 80 to 85 percent of my whole personality, actually. Um, I, uh, I, 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 hate, I hate to come in here and have you at a disadvantage, but I'm aware. I, I watched your uh, last interview with your sort of exit interview with Dysart uh, maybe two or three times. I love that interview. Uh, really? And I thought it was full of insight about Harbinger. Uh, you'll find we're big uh, uh, fans of Josh's uh, in general. And so it, I, I really love that interview quite a lot. So kudos to you right up front. It made, it made me excited to come talk to you because you clearly oh. understand the characters. Thank you so much. Wow. I'm, I'm, is the blushing coming up? <laughs> wow. And that's my secret weapon. I just roll in with a cop <laughs> right away and give you on. No, I, I'm, I'm being honest. It was, it was, they're, they're great. Interviews. Don't worry. The, the color correction is making everyone look very professional. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. I'm going to delete all these, uh, all these pressing questions and just jump to the really good questions. Now. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Love it. Good. <laughs> cool. Nice. All right. Um, so before we, before we even get into like the book, uh, just how are you two doing this weekend? we're doing really well i'm doing great uh yesterday was actually my birthday i am oh <laughs> happy birthday thank you very much Woo! uh it was lovely to see friends within a socially distanced and vaccine mandated uh social situation uh and just really nice to see people yeah wonderful. We, don't, we don't get enough of that no it was a really good party it was great um, and then obviously this week's been kind of insane for us uh, on top of that because the world gave us all a Collins birthday gift in uh, funding our Kickstarter Wolf, with Wolf, uh, which is our- Which Wolf? Uh, with Wolf, W-I-F-W-U-L-F. Uh, 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 it was a Kickstarter we launched over the week uh, with an artist named Dalen Ogden. We hit our funding goal in nine hours, which we thought was going to take us a lot longer than that. Um, wow. And now- Congratulations. We're, uh, yeah. Now we're putting together all of our stretch goals and all that stuff. Um, but that dropped on Kickstarter on Thursday and kind of changed our week up. So it's been, yeah, it's been a really wild week. Uh, and we've been very uh, thankful and very uh, humbled by the whole response to it. It was pretty wild. Yeah. Mazel tov. That's awesome. Um, we'll, uh, we'll throw the link uh, in the description for Whiff Wolf. Uh, so people can check that out as well. Um, but the reason we're here today is to talk about the adventures of Peter Stanchik. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm going to kind of jump in. Like, I'm going straight for the kind of like, the pressing questions. Um, so Peter Stanchik, very controversial protagonist um, and not even really a hero. He's actually done really, really bad things, especially going back to like the first Joshua Dysart issue in 2012. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, the way, the way he treated Chris Hathaway and everything. So the story you're writing just right out the gate and I, just full disclaimer, I've read it you haven't not you guys but the audience hasn't um and it's really good but um it seems like the tone i'm getting is that it's going to be a very redemptive arc um do, first of all is that is that a, accurate and second of all is that a challenge with this character yes uh i think to both counts uh, i think it's when we were first approached about coming on and taking on Harbinger, it was as fans first um we we've been huge fans of the character we've been huge, huge fans of Valiance, and we've been trying to sort of shove our way in for, for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, for several years, uh, we've been trying to find our fit in, in the Valiant universe. So when they came at us with Harbinger, we were a little taken aback, if only because it's one of the hardest things to do. Um, not only is it one of the hardest things to do because Harbinger is in and of itself a, a response to the X-Men and a response to all these other sort of exterior um, uh, concepts, uh, but also because within the, its own world, Harbinger is complicated and fraught because of Peter. Because Peter, by being our lens into the story and by being of the protagonist of the story from the get-go, and I know you can you can empathize with Faith and you can empathize with Chris and you can even empathize with Toa Harada, but Peter's the protagonist. And as Peter has moved through that universe, he hasn't always acted like a hero. To your very point, he's acted um, much more like a, a, a person would. Um, and frankly, a, a damaged person, a person with drug problems and a person- An addict like, in a lot of ways. Yes. Um, he's addicted to his own power and that like any of us, that can lead to incredibly toxic behavior. Um, and that's part of the, to the, to the strength of the character. The line, uh, dice arts are on everything leading up to this has been so wonderfully evocative and never really shied away from the fact that he's not that, he's not a hero. He's inevitably a person pushed to the edge who can do heroic things 100%, but he's a damaged kind of person. And that was when they were like, well, would you guys have a take on Harbinger? We were like, well, 
only if we can explore this damage. Um, he is, he is a, he's addicted to his own privilege. And that needs to be something that he can look at and body check. And we needed the freedom to be able to unpack that and look at it for kind of the ugliness that it is. Well, especially because it's very personal, right? Every person has, I think, a version of their, of their life they wish they'd led and the version of the life that they did lead. We've all made mistakes. We've all made um, errors that have hurt other people. Some of us obviously to much larger extent um, than others. But I think everybody can understand what it means to feel guilt about the past and not really know how to move on from that. And so we thought, okay, that's something very universal. That's something we can speak about very personally because we're two people who are not perfect. And then how can we then take that, you know, in th that intention of doing something really personal and really strong and then apply that and universal and apply that to a really specific character case, which is Peter Stanchek, man of a million powers and very little redemptive capability um, and how do we follow through on the promise that Josh made all those many times in Harbinger that someday Peter Stanchip was going to get better he was going to become a better person he was going to move in better ways and he was going to show how one goes about that and um, we were like look if, you, if we're going to come on to this we can't shy our way away from that we have to embrace it head on or we are just biding time until the story that finally does it and the story that finally does it needs to be that story. And it needs to not be the last Peter Stanchik story. It needs to be the first of a whole new run, a whole new era of Peter Stanchik stories. And obviously enormous hubris on us to think that that's what we could do, but that's the job. And so that's when we, when we came on on Peter, a big point of it was coming on and trying to say, how do you take this guy? The thing that I think we got really excited about when we finally got to take this character on is that it wasn't going to be a simple matter of doing a story where Peter got better. It was going to have to be a story where Peter took on the responsibility of becoming better and then went through it incrementally, which is all anybody can do. If he is an addict, we have to take him through some manner of recovery. That's not going to be a traditional recovery. We're not taking him through 12 steps. That's not the process. But we are going to have him prescribe uh, a, uh, a way forward, uh, both for himself and, and, and uh, a way will sort of be prescribed by the people around him. And to some degree, a way has been prescribed by whoever it is who messed with his mind, uh, which is a, 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 a sort of larger story concept we're going to get to. So we really felt like there was just a lot of story length uh, uh, at play in terms of redeeming uh, Peter Stanchek. It wasn't mm -hmm. something you were going to do in, in a single issue. And as soon as you see that, then you're like, all right, we've got to run. Then we know there's a way forward. We can do something cool. We can do something exciting. We can do some superhero comics and also have it mean something. Um, and so that's where uh, the Harbinger started. That sounds fascinating. I really can't wait to see how that happens. Um, it sounds, it does sound difficult, but it sounds, it sounds like a ride. <laughs> um, so just talking about uh, Robbie Rodriguez for a second. So the work he's doing here is very kinetic and unique um, and pretty awesome. Um, yeah. And very, ne very neon too. Uh, um, That's Rico. Yeah. Yeah. Rico <laughs> Renzi, man. He, he, he knows where to drop the uh, colors you do not expect. Yep. Yeah, um, it, it definitely keeps me awake. Um, so <laughs> the, the question I have is, as a writer, how when you're dealing with an artist with such a unique style, how do you leverage that style um, for your advantage to tell the story? Well, one of the first things that you got to do when you're working with Robbie is you got to acknowledge his design aesthetic. Um, you don't put him in a box. You don't want to tell him like, you know what, everyone's going to be wearing like form-fitting black unitards. It's like, no, 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 you have, you have Robbie Rodriguez. So you let him design. So that was one of the first steps that we took was, you know, we didn't want to have Peter just facing off against this classic rogues gallery, especially with Harada off the board. We needed to introduce a new crop of people for him to be facing. Uh, and that is going to be the, the current superhero team of Chicago, uh, the Warnick which everybody loves. They are beloved by the city. Uh, and that's mostly because no one knows what they're doing to the Syot population. Um, but with, uh, Or they know and they don't care. With those characters though, we wanted to unleash Robbie on them. So that was the first step. It was like, let's get out of Robbie's way. Let's let him design this new Harbinger suit that Peter will slowly be earning the opportunity to wear. Um, Cause you can't just wake up one day and say, mask on superhero, right? <laughs> he has to earn it. Um, but also, yeah, giving Robbie the chance to design these new, absolutely awesome villains for Peter to face off against. Um, so that was like first step, costume. And then I think second step, um, and it's interesting because issue one was kind of written before we knew that we were working with Robbie, right? So issue one was written in absence of understanding who the artist of the book on the book was going to be. And we had written that um, in a style that we really thought like, 
okay, in our heads, and just to be honest, we, I think we've been honest about this in general, we had really thought about the book as being very grounded when we came onto it. Like part of the point of it, I love Dysart's run and part of the point of what it, what it does so well is evokes the real world and real life and the real uh, 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 alleys and corners and, and uh, dirty houses garbage. and the, the places we find ourselves when we're at our lowest. And when you're working with Robbie, it's like you're gonna get an aspect of that because his stuff has this great street art grime on the wall vibe. But as Colin put, enormously kinetic, full of design, not a book that's really about just like living in the real world. It's about a book that elevates up into this, like what we, what we fondly refer to internally as sort of a punk rock Akira aesthetic. And if you're yes. going to do that, right, if we're going to push into that territory, all right, well, then you have to start freeing up the artist to do that. You got to stop writing the book like it's going to always be drawn in this like very regimented style. Yeah. And what we found really exciting about that, and one of the big reasons that I think Heather Antos initially brought Robbie on board on this project, is because the deeper we get into this story, the more and more time we're going to be spending dealing with um, Peter's mind, Peter's, uh, the, uh, Peter's, te his telepathy up until this point has been demonstrated in a pretty limited way, visually. The sting is sort of a, a glint in his eye and a glint in a person's mind, and that's really all we ever sort of get from it. And now was a time for us to say, all right, Peter's power, just like him, is going to sort of change and grow and evolve. And as that happens, we're going to need new visual ways of demonstrating it. Yeah. And that's where you start to write to Robbie. And you start to say, all right, Robbie, let's find a new way to do this. And we're not going to tell you what that is. We're going to tell you a bunch of evocative imagery and we're going to get you there. Which is like, similar to uh, the way that we work with um, some of our other like sort of comics brothers, like uh, Marcus Toe, where Joyride was written without panel description. Um, we wrote that entire book almost like a screenplay, uh, but because we also work in that medium, but that, that was a place for us to get really like uh, uh, experimental. Mm -hmm. And we could write like tone poems and then Marcus would bring them to life. Yeah. Uh, issue four of Harbinger mm -hmm. is that on a grand scale. And I think sort of shows what happens when you let Robbie just go. Yeah, uh, It's it's gonna be Woo! a issue of comics. I'm very excited. <laughs> One of the, any, <laughs> any fan of ours will know that uh, occasionally we just really need to get out of the artist's way and let them get psychedelic. Uh, because these are superheroes and you need to start cracking out of the expected forms. Issue three of Joyride, issue three of Tomb Raider Inferno. Like we do it in almost every book we do. We have like a weird. Green Arrow 48 and 49. I wonder, that's that's weird for us. Um, <laughs> but what we, oh my goodness, I had a good, oh yeah. But also um, that was a big step of the design is like, well, we have Robbie, but also we have Rico. And these two guys work as a team. They work as a unit. But when we were like, well, we don't want the sting to be like, but we, we, we got to mix it up. And Rico rolls in, he's like, I got you. And once again, that's where that neon palette starts to come from because we really wanted to mix it up. And that's the kind of, if you can think of uh, his power as kind of like, you know, I don't know, raw energy, coloring is where that's going to live. Um, so it's like a t you, get, you get two awesome fists to get into the fight of, I don't know, I lost the metaphor. I like that. Yeah. I, love I get it. it. I get it. Two of them are amazing. You get out of their way. There we go. Answered. Awesome. Sweet. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, awesome. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it is truly, we feel the same way. We get new pages and we're like, oh my God, that's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it was, it was a, when, cause we've been working on this book for years. When we got that at first design, it was so hard for me not to be like showing it to everybody I knew. Just, yeah, because new, new Harbinger, it's like, don't show that to everybody, Jackson. But just so seeing cool. the, just seeing like the over bef during the promo before we got the advanced copy, just seeing like the aesthetic, I was like, oh, cyberpunk Harbinger, of course. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's cool because, like, we never used the word cyberpunk once developing Harbinger. We, yeah. it, which is interesting because we've been doing a lot of cyberpunk. We're doing Batman Beyond to DC. We have this thing called, uh, we have this thing that we're doing with um, uh, uh, Simon Games um, for Android. Uh, we're doing a lot of little cyberpunk things here and there. We had never, in the process of doing Harbinger, ever thought about cyberpunk. And now people are reading it and reviews are coming out, and so many people are like, Cyberpunk Harbinger, really? It's the like neon, it. yeah, right. and it's the neon. It's the aesthetic. We didn't yeah, write. Not... We wrote punk, yeah, and then the aesthetic brought the cyber, and now we have cyberpunk. And I'm like, I'm like, it, it's cool. It's interesting. It wasn't the intention on the writing side. It just kind of like developed out of the build. Maybe right now we need to put the kibosh on it and introduce a new term. Syat punk. Punk. Yes, you, get it. you get it, bud. <laughs> yes. Oh no. <laughs> All right, oh, that's, that's done, what the book is done, now. Well done, done. solved. Yeah, awesome. Uh, in the movie, <laughs> that's so good. Yes, um, you know nothing about the actual movie. Don't 
<laughs> the screen rant writes an article immediately. It's in the movie. It's, no, we don't. <laughs> but screen rant, come on. No, nah, just kidding. Um, so uh, some fan oh. fanboy questions uh, regarding the Valiant Universe connectivity. Um, are we going to see you know Bloodshot, Livewire, EXO, any Renegades, or maybe Gen Zero kids? Uh, not for a little bit. Uh, and that is not because we don't love them uh, or because we don't want to, but because it was deeply important that Peter stand on his own two feet for a little bit and not be constantly barraged by the people who already know him. Because people who know Peter have a perspective on Peter, and Peter needs to figure out what Peter thinks about Peter. Ah, um, okay. Right so we really wanted to give him new characters, new supporting cast, new connectivity, um, not rely on what it meant everyone from a connectivity perspective everyone still knows who peter stanchuk is mm -hmm. everyone's very aware you see in issue one like on you know pretty early pages once people start to realize that peter's around stanchuk protocols go into place because right, of, right. It, like it is it is now an official thing that happens when peter stanchuk shows up it's it's, it's bad news there are paramilitary protocols for this guy but um, do we want to immediately throw him up against Bloodshot? No, but partially that's because the minute you throw Peter Stanchuk up against Bloodshot, you've got a harbinger war, and you got to build to that kind of thing. So mm. for us, it was really important to spend at least these first four issues mm -hmm. standing Pete back up on his feet and yeah. figuring out who the harbinger was. After that, that makes sense. after that, you got to know that we started asking those questions the same way you did. Um, and, okay. And we will have a lot more to say about that, I think, very soon. You said something earlier. Um, I can't remember. I one of you said something earlier that kind of like gave me like just a tweak of disappointment. You said Harada's off the board, but at the end of Imperium, he's still kind of alive. He's he self imposes. Yeah. Okay. He, he took himself off the board, and out of respect for that move, yeah. we are. Trust me, it's a disappointment to us too. We love. Him. Okay. Yeah. Imperium is my favorite book. Uh, I, so I, good. I, I love so, it. I, we we love it deeply. It just, I think what uh, DC had a great uh, great term, turn of phrase. Uh, you need to what was it like? Not retire the character, but the character needs to rest. Mm. We're letting the character rest. Like okay, we might you know and, like like Dracula. We might not be the ones who open up the casket, but the casket is there, and he could once again be released. I, I and the. And certainly we hope we are. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> that, that's a character who, once you reestablish Peter, you want to reestablish Toyo. But, like, again, if we're going to if we're gonna order all of this around Peter Stanchik, which we are, right? Yeah. That's that's the thesis statement of everything we're doing, is ordering this, this thing that has always been, like, a universe and a team and all this stuff. Okay, we're going to order it around Peter so it has a really, really strong backbone, and then we can start to build on that. Once that backbone is established, Toyo Rada is the... He's the ultimate test of that backbone. So when that happens, again, whether that's us or someone else, we really hope that what, the work that we're doing right now makes that the most powerful story possible. Mm -hmm. um, and whether we have some ideas about how that would work or not, I would just say, hold on. <laughs> yeah. we, 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 we seem like excitable guys who talk about story a lot. So you can imagine we've had some discussions about what that might be. Yeah, I'm holding a little paper under the table being like, you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, it, come on, it's off the record. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that makes total. That totally makes sense to me. Like, um, because then when the coffin does open after like so long or so much buildup, it's really going to be so exciting. <laughs> so, well, and and, and 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 ideally, we'll speak to the fact that Toyo Harada is ready to return. I think that's what's so cool about that character and why I think Imperium needs to be respected is that it wasn't like somebody was like you got to stay off the board to Arata or else. It was Toyo got to the end of it and was like, this is how I win. I win by disappearing for a while. Wow. And it's like, great, man. I'm not going to take that victory from him. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so we've talked a lot about the Joshua Dysart run. Uh, what about as far as the Rafer Roberts run goes, which I really like. It's it's mm -hmm. different. It's a different direction than the, Dysart, the Joshua Dysart run, so it took me a little bit of adjustment, but I kind of grew to appreciate that in its own right. Um, are you taking inspiration from both of those runs or more just from the Joshua run? I mean, definitely from both. Um, yeah. we, okay. we reference, I, I, I mean, I think a couple of times in issue one, at least we reference the, um, that sort of indelible image of Peter in front of Jupiter. 
Um, mm, yes. Which, so Derek Robertson, just to be clear, like is a close friend of ours. We love Derek deeply. We've known him for years. He drew the cover to my very first comic. I love Derek deeply. So I read every issue of that run. Um, you know, I was talking, we were looking at it while Derek yeah. was drawing it. Like we were very involved in that, not involved, in awesome. that, but involved in reading it, obviously mm-hmm. big fans of Rafer and yeah. Like that was during the period where we were trying to first get in on that was when that book was getting released. So we're, 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 we read it. We love it. Um, I think it told its story. So I don't really feel like you need to come in and follow it up. I think it did exactly what it needed to do, but in terms of where it left Peter mm-hmm. and how it revealed aspects of him, uh, especially that aspect that wants to just run away and not deal with his problems ever. Um, this is very much a rejoinder to that. Uh, he literally took Peter as far away from his responsibilities as he possibly can. And we brought him right back. Well, it also taught Peter about not being the alpha. Like that whole book puts Peter in kind of a subservient role on the team to Chris mm-hmm. uh, and to Faith to some degree and to Axe. And I think that's cool. That's good. That taught Peter a little bit about not being in the spotlight, about not being the hero. Um, our book is obviously about him stepping back into that spotlight. So I, I, I like to think of that book as a necessary, you know, that's again, a necessary story. Dysart built the foundation on which it all stands. I think Rafer and Robertson set us up for exactly what needed to be next. Like, I think each of these steps, Harbinger Wars too, like we're following up directly on the lessons of of Harbinger Wars too. Like all of that stuff is all coming to play. And if you want some hints on what's happening to Peter and maybe who it was who messed with his mind, read those stories because the answer will Mm. be inside of them. Um, You know, it's just, we're going to take some time revealing it. Awesome. Yeah. The way you're describing this, it kind of almost sounds like the return of the Jedi or like the third act of a trilogy um which is cool <laughs> i i hope that it is somewhere between that and what uh you know not to compare constantly to the other guys um but what's been able to happen with krakoa uh, i think it's really funny because we started developing harbinger a year before we knew about dawn of x and we watched it happen and in our early documents you can see us sort of talk about th- this idea of Sidot city which you mm-hmm. see in issue one right uh, the the place for Sidot's that they can go that other people can't and and what it means to have a place like that to create home and community we're going to be talking about a very different thing than what x-men is completely but i think that instinct to tell that next story that story that changes the fundamentals enough that you really can open up a new era of storytelling that is an attempt we're trying to make so whether or not we're successful in the long run i think in the short term that's what our our objective has been you just left awesome. it and we're writing Return of the Jedi of, of yeah, Harbinger. That I sounds know. awesome. Sorry. <laughs> no pressure. I yeah. can't help but put the pressure on Moros. Oh, it's also him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, so, so I definitely, I definitely, I kind of picked up on the Krakoa thing, um, just seeing like a, the community of sites, but I also thought of, uh, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but uh, in the more recent IDW Ninja Turtles, there's like a whole mutant city uh, kind of like section that everyone lives in that's like sort of like almost like borderline militarized and oh, wow. so i didn't like, i didn't know about that at all i <laughs> that sounds dope i should read that it's dope. yeah oh no it is it's uh it's pretty go- dope um this comes out uh on the 27th of october um and i think uh the pre-order time is uh has passed or can people still pre-order yeah, we are we are through foc now sweet awesome so definitely check that out um I would be completely remiss if I didn't ask what it was like working with Alyssa Milano on Hacktivist. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Um, I mean, look, short, cool answer, or what? short answer, cool. Hella cool. Very cool. Um, that was one of those projects where um, we sat down with her. Boom was looking for someone who could, you know, someone who kind of spoke a little Hollywood, spoke a little comics. Jack had just published uh, his first uh, creator own book with uh, our best friend, David Server. Uh, and so... Tay it was our Tay. first comic. Yep, yeah, Rebecca Taylor at the time came to Jack, and he was like, well, maybe me and Colin, we write film, so let's give this a shot with Alyssa Milano. We sat down with her at, like, a Cheesecake Factory or something. What? What yeah, did you order? At, like, a macaroni grill or something. Yeah, it was, like, just remember what you in some, <laughs> like, in Calabasas. Yeah, well, it was because she was, she was on set. She was shooting her show, so we had to go, we had to go out to Calabasas to meet close to her show, because she was meeting us effectively on her lunch break from, from shooting. Uh, and uh, it was a weirdly, like, instantly charismatic and charming. I mean, for, it's Alyssa Milano. So when you're sitting down at the table at, with her, it's like, whoa. I mean, there's a reason she's a star, man. Like, yeah. like she has right. star power. 
you step in and you're like, oh yeah, you're you uh, yeah. you've lived this since you were young too. Like you you know what you are. And then she started talking to us about um, cybersecurity and uh, contemporary issues within uh, no technolo technology culture and and like knew it all. And knew it like knew it wow. as well or better than we did and had a lot of really interesting insights that were sort of where we were thinking as well. We were both in kind of this like very optimistic period about social media at the time. And so was she, but she was seeing the dangers of it. And so were we. And, and we, so were, we were also kind of um, very into, at the time we had a good friend uh, who was Iranian and dealing with a lot of the Arab Spring situation, which was really on our mind. Uh, and she's a, you know obviously a massive humanitarian. So this was also an issue that was firmly in, in her mind. So we're also, now we're vibing on not only technology, but vibing on um, current politics and um, how you uplift populations that are being repressed, especially repressed by social media and technology. So it we was, vibed. It was wild. Yeah. And then the next day, uh, we're both in our homes and we hear like a thump on our doors and Jack calls me and I call him and we're like, hey, did you just get this black folio dropped off at your desk? What? We open them up and inside is like 200 pages of hand photocopied cybersecurity papers, fucking highlighted and all the relevant information. I mean, there's a dossier. Yeah, with a big metal clasp on it. Like, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> beautiful leather folios. And with a little note in there just saying like, Jack and Colin, like, let's get started. Let's get started. Yeah, Alyssa yeah. Milano. And it was like, yep, we're doing this. Let's go. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, cannot, cannot speak highly enough about her. She was absolutely wonderful. Yeah, she's, she's, she's really excellent. Um, we, we talked about doing something else together. Uh, and ultimately, we've really just been kind of on our own ride um, for a while. And I think she's really respected that, which has been lovely. Well, also, um, our, our deal with Hacktivist was always, uh, we're riding five minutes into the future. And the technology that we predicted in the Hacktivist One was utilized um, in the, uh, the not riots. No, like, it, was in, it was in the Egyptian revolution. Was well, like yeah, entirely Egyptian built revolution. on that and, and the democratic protests in Hong Kong. Yeah. Like mm. we, a lot of the stuff that we had seen coming happened. And then, you know, no, no, not like we were responsible in any, in, in yeah, any respect. Yeah, we have no Sadamas, we're yeah. just reading trends. Yeah, we just were reading trends and we sort of saw where it was going and we wrote about it and then that happened. And then we did it again in volume two, um, again with Alyssa. And the whole point of it was, was like, we were swinging with these like really big things and Alyssa kept being like, make sure to keep it realistic and keep it like something that can happen. And so we did it. And then um, issue one of volume two of Hacktivist opens with an, a, a, a cyber attack that is functionally identical to the Sony hack, which happened like less than a month before our book launched. Yeah. So wow. our book came out like three weeks after the Sony hack and featured the Sony hack. And everybody was like, how did this happen? How did they do this comic so fast? And it's like, we didn't. We predicted this eight months ago. Knew someone did the was... FBI come visit you or anything? No, like thank that? God. Like, I think that's the thing. Is they're, <laughs> they're, they're looking at the same stuff we are. It, we're, we are all going to the same place for information, which is black hat and white hat hackers who are interested in talking about this stuff and want to get in with it. And then there's, there's conferences. And if you want to find this stuff, it's very easy to find, which is good and bad. Yeah. Um, it is, it is, it is lovely because it means we can all find a way to think about it, write about it. And it's bad because if somebody wants to learn how to make a lot of damage, they can find it. And yeah. so I think that was a thing that we, you know, yeah. we learned on Hacktivist and now we're like, if we ever go back into that well again, it has to Hacktivist do with a lot of responsibility. Hacktivist too worked with large scale um, social media manipulation of like politics and populations. And then we're like, look, Hacktivist 3 freaks us the hell out. Yeah, so, Hack 3 is scary. <laughs> I, don't, if it up, like, I don't think we're ready for that kind of responsibility. So Hacktivist 3 is just going to hang out for a while. And we have really something to say. We'll finish the trilogy. Yeah, but I that's can, too much yeah. of a responsibility at this moment. Yeah. Anyway. Can, can barely wrap my head, my head around the Hacktivist 2 level. So, yeah. 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 It's neither could we. <laughs> that, took, that book took like two years to write. Anyway, yeah. So... You two are frequent collaborators. Um, you guys work together a lot, kind of like a, the Kyle Yost or like, a, or um, Abnett Lanning, like mm -hmm. always, always frequently writing together. Um, what exactly happens when your two minds come together and who sort of provides what? Like kind of walk me through this process. Sure. I, like the, I like that question. Um, so it's not just that we write frequently, it's that we write exclusively. Um, we only write together. We've been writing together for uh, going on 12 years at this point. Um, we kind of accidentally started when we had a time to kill and we started writing a screenplay together for yucks, basically. Like, like right out of college. We met in college. We've been friends since we were, you know, 18. And uh, that screenplay we wrote together was better than anything we'd ever written apart. So we were like, I, this has got some kind of magic. We almost sold it to Fox. Like it was like a year long development process for us. We were both out of college and suddenly we were like successful screenwriters because 
like successful screenwriters yeah um because uh uh we found something that worked between the two of us but even we weren't entirely sure what that was or how that yeah worked. and we were we were 21 year olds and absolute idiots yeah so you know it took a little while for us to figure out how this all works but um which is why we can write something like the harbinger because we know what it's like to be a total idiot yeah <laughs> um but yeah we uh we write every thursday and every sunday uh we've been writing together uh, yeah two times a week for 12 years uh effectively we outline the hell out of absolutely everything uh we which which happens as a conversation yeah um we we just sit here like we are now like we're in we're in my dining room right now um like this is my house uh with my bar behind me like we're at the, my kitchen table um we'll sit on one side of this or the other he sits there i sit here and we just talk and sometimes we yell yep and we just get in it and uh, i share my opinion and he shares his opinion and we both know that the other person like respects the other one endemically because we've been doing like we've tied our finances, our lives, and our creativity together for twelve years. So at this point, it's like any anything that I'm doing to sabotage Colin is self sabotage. Yeah. Um. So we we know the other person has the best of intentions, and 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 we have internal trust. And so then we just talk about story mm-hmm. and find the right story. And and if it's something that I like and something that he likes, we know that it's something that goes out in the high mind. And to your answer, um, you know, we'll be clashing ideas against each other and perhaps even getting more and more frustrating. But the moment those minds link, it's literally like cold water splashed on us both. Whatever that heated conversation then drops down to zero, we kind of look at each other with a... And then we work. Um, because that's where the work comes from. I, I, the, in terms of who brings what, I think that that is a really hard thing to say at this yeah. point. Um, I, I don't think that we, I think somebody maybe on the ex- outside might be able to diagnose that. I think it's very, yeah. very, and I, and I welcome readers to try, but I, I genuinely don't think we could. Um, and I'm not sure they could either. Uh, the, the thing that I will say that I think is not always true, but might be more prevalently true than, than anything else about our process is that Colin is deeply, deeply interested in innovation. And I'm pretty interested in practical architecture. Um, Like, I really like to be able to look at something and be like, I can see the whole thing. I've been a video editor for a really long time, so I really like to be able to see the entire construct, know that it's all going to work, and then be able to be like, great, let's execute. I've got sort of like Mm. a John, to use the Green Lantern term, I've got kind of a John Stewart thing going on. And I am a full-on Kyle Rayner. Like, I will just jazz, baby. Like, I'll get where I'll start. I'll end up some random place. And then it's like, you did not conform to the outline. And I'll be like, yeah, but check out what it is. And yeah. I'm like, oh, shit, that's pretty good. And, and that's the so, thing. And so even within story uh, uh, construct, I will be a little bit more willing to be like, okay, well, I've seen this road done before, so let's follow this road. And Colin is always sort of at the ready to be like, yeah, but somebody's already traveled that road. Let's blow up the road. And I, I think that's a big part of our process is, I think you said something earlier. Like your first question was, I almost brought this up then. Your first question was like, is it, is it hard? Uh, it always. Yeah. Um, and that we make it hard for each other. Yeah. Because if he was doing it alone or I was doing it alone, we wouldn't have to answer the other guy. Mm-hmm. And we wouldn't have to justify it quite as much. We just like do what we thought was cool. Every choice gets interrogated and needs to stand up against that interrogation. So it's kind of so like. It's, a, it's harder. Yeah. But I mean, you know, uh, two, two knives sharpen each other. You've already made it past the first critic before you've even that, put yes, something on the page. Bingo. Yeah. Uh, and just so it's said, uh, I often blow up bridges and then it's like, dude, we needed that bridge. <laughs> yes, that it's is like, oh, <laughs> that, That's where I'm useful. That's where I'm not just a stick in the mud. That so, is my bad. <laughs> what, 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 about, what about when, uh, so when one of you falls in love with an idea, like, and you know how sometimes in a creative space, you'll just... There's an idea and you love it just because of what it is. And no one can really talk you out of loving it. Do you ever have a situation where one of you just wants to kill that thing and you have to be like, hey, I really like this. Please yeah. just. And, and that's the conversation almost exactly. Yep. It's like, oh, I, I don't understand why this is happening. I think we should get rid of it. And then the other person goes, yeah, but I really like it. Can I talk to you about it? And you talk to you about it in a while until, in, until it's either made sense or doesn't. And if it doesn't make sense, it can some, sometimes still come down to, yeah, but I really like this. Can we keep it? Great. We'll and then it. it's like, yeah, all right, let's keep it. Yeah. Because one, one, one thing like that, that's where the, the personal generation comes from. Like you don't want to kill all the darlings. Yeah. But we do kill a lot of darlings. We kill a lot of darlings. Um, and, and I think that's, that's, I think that that's like the scar tissue you have to develop as a writer long enough where eventually you hit a point where even if you fall in love with something, that does, you, you know that doesn't mean that it's right. If you ever read in your ever reading in one of our books, there's like 
a stupid joke. <laughs> That's probably one of the things I'm like, this is in the book. And Jack's like, it is not good. Is and I'm like, joke. I don't care. They are making this pun right now. It's like, I can't help it. But it's, but it's cool. I can't <laughs> If you ever read a pun, it's called I can't make them. I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Uh, so it's 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 a really okay. a but, good but, but, a good relationship. Occasionally, occasionally your heart will be absolutely truly broken, and that's probably this guy. Yeah, so. yeah, sometimes, 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 I sometimes you're sometimes. very good at that. We're, we're, we're you hard. just think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> he once wrote this comedy script. He was like, "It's just so funny. This is so funny." It was for a Maze Runner thing. He was like, "It's a silly, funny story about this, about a zombie. It's silly, silly, funny story." And he made our editor cry, and he made me cry, and he made readers cry. And there's nothing funny about the story at all. It's like de desperately sad. And he wrote it entirely on his own. That was the one time where we were like, we had two short stories to do. And I was like, I'll write one, he'll write the other, whatever. We, like, it, we each get a vacation. Um, and uh, mine was fine. His was like genuinely excellent. And, it, and he thought it was funny. But everyone was crying. And it was like, <laughs> it's funny. He's a zombie, and he'll never see his family again. Hilarious! <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, man. Like, so that's that's our that's our rambly way of trying to describe what we do, which is go. we're friends. We talk about the story, and then we write the story that we both like. Yeah, it's very spe very special and unique. I like it. it. Is. Um, People ask us yeah. like, oh, how do how do you do it, or like how you know, give me tips for working with a writing partner. It's like, uh, it's like asking Silent Bob how to find Jay. Like, I don't know, man. Like, we got really lucky. Yeah. Like, we got really lucky. I mean, we met each other. We have really similar backgrounds. We have really similar tastes. We're both fans of one another. And we can stand to not kill each other for 15 yeah. years. Like, it's nice. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so we're going to have to wrap this up. But before we uh, before we get to the end here, just uh, any final thoughts that you'd like to leave our audience to whet their appetite for the harbinger oh my goodness how how can we whet the appetite if, of the audience for harbinger if if it's not already whetted um no um <laughs> all right so if you sorry hit, i'm i'm no it's fine you broke me a little bit <laughs> whetted uh, yeah whetted. um all I, right go ahead oh i um i think we've one of the things that we really are fascinated by is once you really start unpacking what Peter's power set is. Um, he has TK on a level that is nigh on omnipotent. Um, like he is easily one of the most power, he's the most powerful psyot on the board. And you could make an argument that he's one of the most powerful like meta humans in, in comics. In comics. Yeah. Um, so the idea that he exclusively uses his powers to throw things and stop things and, you know, like, no, that's fine. But with wiping Peter's slate clean, he's able to approach his powers in a brand new way, which gives him the ability to reflect and revitalize how they're used. Because as soon as you start to realize you have the ability to manipulate any single molecule, well, then you can really start doing some pretty interesting things. Like so, that Harada gun disintegration shit. Yeah, exactly. And that's just oh. where we start. Right. So, and I mean, and I, I think the other thing I'll say, um, because he hasn't been mentioned yet, and it's a big, uh, you know, part of the process. Uh, one of the things that I think is really powerful about this book and helps bring the punk in the psyot punk, uh, if we're going to use that right, is uh, Hassan's lettering. Oh yeah, um, Hassan uh, Atmani Alau, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is an absolutely stellar letterer for people who don't follow panel x panel or like really know how um, much work uh, Hassan puts into uh, his work, like. It's incredible uh, lettering, hand done, beautiful work, um, and very innovative. Uh, sort of constantly thinking about how to push past uh, what we normally do with letters, which is a big part of what this whole book is. Uh, pushing past Peter Stanchik, the kind of stories you've told about him in the past, pushing past the aesthetic that's been with Peter Stanchik this whole time, and now pushing past the lettering structures that we're sort of used to with Peter. Um, the way that we bring to life uh, the sort of psychic battle that's happening within Peter, the way that we're dealing with psychic battles that are happening exterior to Peter, uh, and the way that just normal conversation comes alive uh, in Austin's hands is, is pretty incredible. So if for nothing else other than getting to see some really cool lettering of doing some really innovative stuff, uh, I think the book is worth uh, a check out. 
Um, but then I think once you go there and look at that, I think you just might find a book you really dig. Even if you don't know Peter Stanchek. In fact, yep. if you've never read a Harbinger book before, mm -hmm. I really hope this is the book for you. Because if it's not, something's gone terribly wrong. The entire point <laughs> is that Peter doesn't know who he is. So if you don't know who Peter is, we welcome you into this story. Um, it's a great jumping on point and designed specifically to be a jumping on point for new readers, uh, while also absolutely rewarding the readers of the classic, of the, of the franchise and everything that's come before. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, that's our show. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, and bees, thank you so much for watching. Special thanks to Colin and uh, Jackson. Thank you for joining us. Um, thanks to Greg over at Valiant for setting this up. And uh, let me, I have to say, if you're a Valiant fan and you watch this interview and you're not literally dying with excitement, then I don't, <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't imagine. Well, um, yeah, this is uh, this is going to be pretty dope um, and pretty pretty amazing. Um, continue watching this space. Uh, we have uh, some more interviews coming down the road. We have Club Valiant. We have uh, Delirium Hour. We're on book eight. So uh, definitely uh, keep uh, watching the space. Wear your mask. Wash your hands. Be nice to people. And have a wonderful day. Bye. <laughs> If you want to hear interviews from industry pros, get first looks, and have access to endless comic content, wake up. Please wake up. You're in a coma. Your mother misses you.